Section 41 of Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jim Clevenger. Personal Memoirs of U.S. Grant by Ulysses S. Grant. Chapter 41. Assuming the Command at Chattanooga opening a line of supplies battle of wahatchee on the picket line the next day the twenty fourth i started out to make a personal inspection taking thomas and smith with me besides most of the members of my personal staff we crossed to the north side of the river and moving to the north of detached spurs of hills reached the tennessee at brown's ferry some three miles below lookout mountain unobserved by the enemy here we left our horses back from the river and approached the water on foot there was a picket station of the enemy on the opposite side of about twenty men in full view and we were within easy range they did not fire upon us, nor seemed to be disturbed by our presence. They must have seen that we were all commissioned officers. But, I suppose, they looked upon the garrison of Chattanooga as prisoners of war, feeding or starving themselves, and thought it would be inhuman to kill any of them except in self-defense. That night I issued orders for opening the route to Bridgeport a cracker line, as the soldiers appropriately termed it, they had been so long on short rations that my first thought was the establishment of a line over which food might reach them. Chattanooga is on the south bank of the Tennessee, where that river runs nearly due west. It is at the northern end of a valley, five or six miles in width, through which Chattanooga Creek runs. To the east of the valley is Missionary Ridge, rising from five to eight hundred feet above the creek and terminating somewhat abruptly a half mile or more before reaching the Tennessee. On the west of the valley is Lookout Mountain, twenty-two hundred feet above tidewater. Just below the town the Tennessee makes a turn to the south and runs to the base of Lookout Mountain leaving no level ground between the mountain and river. The Memphis and Charleston Railroad passes this point, where the mountain stands nearly perpendicular. East of Missionary Ridge flows the South Chickamauga River. West of Lookout Mountain is Lookout Creek, and west of that, Raccoon Mountains. Lookout Mountain at its northern end rises almost perpendicularly for some distance then breaks off in a gentle slope of cultivated fields to near the summit where it ends in a palisade thirty or more feet in height on the gently sloping ground between the upper and lower palisades there is a single farmhouse which is reached by a wagon road from the valley east the entrenched line of the enemy commenced on the north end of Missionary Ridge and extended along the crest for some distance south, thence across Chattanooga Valley to Lookout Mountain. Lookout Mountain was also fortified and held by the enemy, who also kept troops in Lookout Valley West and on Raccoon Mountain, with pickets extending down the river so as to command the road on the north bank and render it useless to us. In addition to this, there was an entrenched line in Chattanooga Valley, extending from the river east of the town to Lookout Mountain, to make the investment complete. Besides the fortifications on Mission Ridge, there was a line at the base of the hill with occasional spurs of rifle pits halfway up the front. The enemy's pickets extended out into the valley towards the town so far that the pickets of the two armies could converse, 
At one point they were separated only by the narrow creek which gives its name to the valley and town, and from which both sides drew water. The Union lines were shorter than those of the enemy. Thus the enemy, with a vastly superior force, was strongly fortified to the east, south, and west, and commanded the river below. Practically, the Army of the Cumberland was besieged. The enemy had stopped with his cavalry north of the river the passing of a train loaded with ammunition and medical supplies. The Union Army was short of both, not having ammunition enough for a day's fighting. General Halleck had, long before my coming into this new field, ordered parts of the 11th and 12th Corps, commanded respectively by Generals Howard and Slocum, Hooker in command of the whole, from the Army of the Potomac to reinforce Rosecrans. It would have been folly to send them to Chattanooga to help eat up the few rations left there. They were consequently left on the railroad, where supplies could be brought to them. Before my arrival, Thomas ordered their concentration at Bridgeport. General W. F. Smith had been so instrumental in preparing for the move which I was now about to make, and so clear in his judgment about the manner of making it, that I deemed it but just to him that he should have command of the troops detailed to execute the design, although he was then acting as a staff officer and was not in command of troops. On the 24th of October, after my return to Chattanooga, the following details were made. General Hooker, who was now at Bridgeport, was ordered to cross to the south side of the Tennessee and march up by Whitesides and Wahatchee to Brown's Ferry. General Palmer, with a division of the 14th Corps, Army of the Cumberland, was ordered to move down the river on the north side by a back road until opposite Whitesides, then cross and hold the road in Hooker's rear after he had passed. Four thousand men were, at the same time, detailed to act under General Smith directly from Chattanooga. Eighteen hundred of them, under General Hazen, were to take sixty pontoon boats, and, under cover of night, float by the pickets of the enemy at the north base of Lookout, down to Brown's Ferry, then land on the south side and capture or drive away the pickets at that point. Smith was to march with the remainder of the detail, also under cover of night, by the north bank of the river to Brown's Ferry, taking with him all the material for laying the bridge as soon as the crossing was secured. On the 26th, Hooker crossed the river at Bridgeport and commenced his eastward march. At three o'clock on the morning of the 27th, Hazen moved into the stream with his sixty pontoons and eighteen hundred brave and well-equipped men. Smith started enough in advance to be near the river when Hazen should arrive. There are a number of detached spurs of hills north of the river at Chattanooga, back of which is a good road parallel to the stream sheltered from the view from the top of Lookout. It was over this road Smith marched. At five o'clock Hazen landed at Brown's Ferry, surprised the picket guard, and captured most of it. By seven o'clock the whole of Smith's force was ferried over and in possession of a height commanding the ferry. This was speedily fortified while a detail was laying the pontoon bridge. By ten o'clock the bridge was laid and our extreme right, now in Lookout Valley, was fortified and connected with the rest of the army. The two bridges over the Tennessee River a flying one at Chattanooga, and the new one at Brown's Ferry, with the road north of the river, covered from both the fire and the view of the enemy, made the connection complete. 
hooker found but slight obstacles in his way and on the afternoon of the twenty eighth emerged into lookout valley at wahatchee howard marched on to brown's ferry while geary who commanded a division in the twelfth corps stopped three miles south the pickets of the enemy on the river below were now cut off and soon came in and surrendered the river was now open to us from lookout valley to bridgeport between brown's ferry and kelly's ferry the tennessee runs through a narrow gorge in the mountains which contracts the stream so much as to increase the current beyond the capacity of an ordinary steamer to stem it to get up these rapids steamers must be cordelled that is pulled up by ropes from the shore but there is no difficulty in navigating the stream from bridgeport to kelly's ferry the latter point is only eight miles from chattanooga and connected with it by a good wagon road which runs through a low pass in the raccoon mountains on the south side of the river to brown's ferry thence on the north side to the river opposite chattanooga there were several steamers at bridgeport and abundance of forage clothing and provisions on the way to chattanooga i had telegraphed back to nashville for a good supply of vegetables and small rations which the troops had been so long deprived of hooker had brought with him from the east a full supply of land transportation his animals had not been subjected to hard work on bad roads without forage but were in good condition in five days from my arrival in chattanooga the way was opened to bridgeport and with the aid of steamers and hookers teams in a week the troops were receiving full rations it is hard for any one not an eye-witness to realize the relief this brought the men were soon reclothed and also well fed an abundance of ammunition was brought up and a cheerfulness prevailed not before enjoyed in many weeks neither officers nor men looked upon themselves any longer as doomed the weak and languid appearance of the troops so visible before disappeared at once i do not know what the effect was on the other side but assume it must have been correspondingly depressing mr davis had visited bragg but a short time before and must have perceived our condition to be about as bragg described it in his subsequent report these dispositions he said faithfully sustained ensured the enemy's speedy evacuation of chattanooga for want of food and forage possessed of the shortest route to his depot and the one by which reinforcements must reach him we held him at our mercy and his destruction was only a question of time but the dispositions were not faithfully sustained and i doubt not but thousands of men engaged in trying to sustain them now rejoice that they were not there was no time during the rebellion when i did not think and often say that the south was more to be benefited by its defeat than the north the latter had the people the institutions and the territory to make a great and prosperous nation the former was burdened with an institution abhorrent to all civilized people not brought up under it and one which degraded labor kept it in ignorance and enervated the governing class with the outside world at war with this institution they could not have extended their territory the labor of the country was not skilled nor allowed to become so the whites could not toil without becoming degraded and those who did were denominated poor white trash the system of labor would have soon exhausted the soil and left the people poor the non-slaveholders would have left the country and the small slaveholders must have sold out to his more fortunate neighbor 
soon the slaves would have outnumbered the masters and not being in sympathy with them would have risen in their might and exterminated them the war was expensive to the south as well as to the north both in blood and treasure but it was worth all it cost the enemy was surprised by the movements which secured to us a line of supplies he appreciated its importance and hastened to try to recover the line from us his strength on lookout mountain was not equal to hooker's command in the valley below from missionary ridge he had to march twice the distance we had from chattanooga in order to reach lookout valley but on the night of the twenty eighth and twenty ninth an attack was made on geary at wahatchee by longstreet's corps when the battle commenced hooker ordered howard up from brown's ferry he had three miles to march to reach geary on his way he was fired upon by rebel troops from a foothill to the left of the road and from which the road was commanded howard turned to the left charged up the hill and captured it before the enemy had time to entrench taking many prisoners leaving sufficient men to hold his height he pushed on to reinforce geary before he got up geary had been engaged for about three hours against a vastly superior force the night was so dark that the men could not distinguish one from another except by the light of the flashes of their muskets in the darkness and uproar hooker's teamsters became frightened and deserted their teams the mules also became frightened and breaking loose from their fastenings stampeded directly towards the enemy the latter no doubt took this for a charge and stampeded in turn by four o'clock in the morning the battle had entirely ceased and our cracker line was never afterward disturbed in securing possession of lookout valley smith lost one man killed and four or five wounded the enemy lost most of his pickets at the ferry captured in the night engagement of the twenty eighth and ninth hooker lost four hundred sixteen killed and wounded i never knew the loss of the enemy but our troops buried over one hundred and fifty of his dead and captured more than a hundred after we had secured the opening of a line over which to bring our supplies to the army i made a personal inspection to see the situation of the pickets of the two armies as i have stated chattanooga creek comes down the centre of the valley to within a mile or such a matter of the town of chattanooga then bears off westerly then northwesterly and enters the tennessee river at the foot of lookout mountain this creek from its mouth up to where it bears off west lay between the two lines of pickets and the guards of both armies drew their water from the same stream as i would be under short-range fire and in an open country i took nobody with me except i believe a bugler who stayed some distance to the rear i rode from our right around to our left when i came to the camp of the picket guard of our side i heard the call turn out the guard for the commanding general i replied never mind the guard and they were dismissed and went back to their tents just back of these and about equally distant from the creek were the guards of the confederate pickets the sentinels on their posts called out in like manner turn out the guard for the commanding general and i believe added general grant their line in a moment front face to the north facing me and gave a salute which i returned the most friendly relations seemed to exist between the pickets of the two armies at one place there was a tree which had fallen across the stream and which was used by the soldiers of both armies in drawing water for their camps general longstreet's corps was stationed there at the time and wore blue of a little different shade from our uniform seeing a soldier in blue on this log i rode up to him 
commenced conversing with him and asked whose corps he belonged to he was very polite and touching his hat to me said he belonged to general longstreet's corps i asked him a few questions but not with a view of gaining any particular information all of which he answered and i rode off end of section forty one recording by jim clevenger little rock arkansas jim at j o c c l e v dot com forty two of personal memoirs of u s grant this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim clevenger personal memoirs of u s grant by ulysses s grant chapter forty two condition of the army rebuilding the railroad general burnside's situation orders for battle plans for the attack hooker's position sherman's movements having got the army of the cumberland in a comfortable position i now begin to look after the remainder of my new command burnside was in about as desperate a condition as the army of the cumberland had been only he was not yet besieged he was a hundred miles from the nearest possible base big south fork of the cumberland river and much farther from any railroad we had possession of the roads back were over mountains and all supplies along the line had long since been exhausted his animals too had been starved, and their carcasses lined the road from Cumberland Gap and far back towards Lexington, Kentucky, East Tennessee still furnished supplies of beef, bread, and forage, but it did not supply ammunition, clothing, medical supplies, or small rations, such as coffee, sugar, salt, and rice. Sherman had started from Memphis for Corinth on the 11th of October his instructions required him to repair the road in his rear in order to bring up supplies the distance was about three hundred and thirty miles through a hostile country his entire command could not have maintained the road if it had been completed the bridges had all been destroyed by the enemy and much other damage done a hostile community lived along the road guerrilla bands infested the country, and more or less of the cavalry of the enemy was still in the west. Often Sherman's work was destroyed as soon as completed, and he only a short distance away. The Memphis and Charleston Railroad strikes the Tennessee River at Eastport, Mississippi. Knowing the difficulty Sherman would have to supply himself from Memphis, i had previously ordered supplies sent from st louis on small steamers to be convoyed by the navy to meet him at eastport these he got i now ordered him to discontinue his work of repairing roads and to move on with his whole force to stevenson alabama without delay this order was borne to sherman by a messenger who paddled down the tennessee in a canoe and floated over Muscle Shoals. It was delivered at Iuka on the 27th. In this, Sherman was notified that the rebels were moving a force towards Cleveland, East Tennessee, and might be going to Nashville, in which event his troops were in the best position to beat them there. Sherman, with his characteristic promptness, abandoned the work he was engaged upon and pushed on at once on the first of november he crossed the tennessee at eastport and that day was in florence alabama with the head of column while his troops were still crossing at eastport with blair bringing up the rear sherman's force made an additional army with cavalry artillery and trains 
all to be supplied by the single track road from Nashville. All indications pointed also to the probable necessity of supplying Burnside's command in East Tennessee, 25,000 more, by the same route. A single track could not do this. I gave, therefore, an order to Sherman to halt General G. M. Dodge's command of about 8,000 men at Athens, and subsequently directed the latter to arrange his troops along the railroad from Decatur north towards Nashville and to rebuild that road. The road from Nashville to Decatur passes over a broken country, cut up with innumerable streams, many of them of considerable width, and with valleys far below the roadbed. All the bridges over these had been destroyed, and the rails taken up and twisted by the enemy. All the cars and locomotives not carried off had been destroyed as effectually as they knew how to destroy them. All bridges and culverts had been destroyed between Nashville and Decatur, and thence to Stevenson, where the Memphis and Charleston and the Nashville and Chattanooga roads unite. The rebuilding of this road would give us two roads as far as Stevenson, over which to supply the army. From Bridgeport, a short distance further east, the river supplements the road. General Dodge, besides being a most capable soldier, was an experienced railroad builder. He had no tools to work with except those of the pioneers, axes, picks, and spades. With these he was able to entrench his men and protect them against surprises by small parties of the enemy. As he had no base of supplies until the road could be completed back to Nashville, the first matter to consider after protecting his men was the getting in of food and forage from the surrounding country. He had his men and teams bring in all the grain they could find, or all they needed, and all the cattle for beef and such other food as could be found. Millers were detailed from the ranks to run the mills along the line of the army. When these were not near enough to the troops for protection, they were taken down and moved up to the line of the road. Blacksmith shops, with all the iron and steel found in them, were moved up in like manner blacksmiths were detailed and set to work making the tools necessary in railroad and bridge building axemen were put to work getting out timber for bridges and cutting fuel for locomotives when the road should be completed car builders were set to work repairing the locomotives and cars thus every branch of railroad building making tools to work with and supplying the workmen with food was all going on at once and without the aid of a mechanic or laborer except what the command itself furnished but rails and cars the men could not make without material and there was not enough rolling stock to keep the road we already had worked to its full capacity there were no rails except those in use to supply these deficiencies I ordered eight of the ten engines General McPherson had at Vicksburg to be sent to Nashville, and all the cars he had except ten. I also ordered the troops in West Tennessee to points on the river and on the Memphis and Charleston Road, and ordered the cars, locomotives, and rails from all the railroads except the Memphis and Charleston to Nashville. The military manager of railroads also was directed to furnish more rolling stock, and, as far as he could, bridge material. General Dodge had the work assigned him finished within forty days after receiving his orders. The number of bridges to rebuild was one hundred and eighty-two, many of them over deep and wide chasms. The length of road repaired was 102 miles. 
The enemy's troops, which it was thought were either moving against Burnside or were going to Nashville, went no farther than Cleveland. Their presence there, however, alarmed the authorities at Washington and, on account of our helpless condition at Chattanooga, caused me much uneasiness. Dispatches were constantly coming, urging me to do something for Burnside's relief, calling attention to the importance of holding East Tennessee, saying the President was much concerned for the protection of the loyal people in that section, etc., we had not at chattanooga animals to pull a single piece of artillery much less a supply train reinforcements could not help burnside because he had neither supplies nor ammunition sufficient for them hardly indeed bread and meat for the men he had there was no relief possible for him except by expelling the enemy from missionary ridge and about chattanooga on the 4th of November, Longstreet left our front with about 15,000 troops, besides Wheeler's cavalry, 5,000 more, to go against Burnside. The situation seemed desperate, and was more aggravating because nothing could be done until Sherman should get up. The authorities at Washington were now more than ever anxious for the safety of Burnside's army, and plied me with dispatches faster than ever, urging that something should be done for his relief. On the 7th, before Longstreet could possibly have reached Knoxville, I ordered Thomas peremptorily to attack the enemy's right, so as to force the return of the troops that had gone up the valley. I directed him to take mules, officers' horses, or animals, wherever he could get them to move the necessary artillery. But he persisted in the declaration that he could not move a single piece of artillery and could not see how he could possibly comply with the order. Nothing was left to be done but to answer Washington dispatches as best I could. Urge Sherman forward, although he was making every effort to get forward, and encourage Burnside to hold on, assuring him that in a short time he should be relieved all of burnside's dispatches showed the greatest confidence in his ability to hold his position as long as his ammunition held out he even suggested the propriety of abandoning the territory he held south and west of knoxville so as to draw the enemy farther from his base and make it more difficult for him to get back to chattanooga when the battle should begin longstreet had a railroad as far as loudon but from there to knoxville he had to rely on wagon trains burnside's suggestion therefore was a good one and it was adopted on the fourteenth i telegraphed him sherman's advance has reached bridgeport his whole force will be ready to move from there by Tuesday at farthest. If you can hold Longstreet in check until he gets up, or by skirmishing and falling back, can avoid serious loss to yourself and gain time, I will be able to force the enemy back from here and place a force between Longstreet and Bragg that must inevitably make the former take to the mountain passes by every available road to get to his supplies. Sherman would have been here before this, but for high water in Elk River, driving him some thirty miles up that river to cross. And again, later in the day, indicating my plans for his relief as follows. Your dispatch and Dana's just received being there you can tell better how to resist longstreet's attack than i can direct with your showing you had better give up kingston at the last moment and save the most productive part of your possessions every arrangement is now made to throw sherman's force across the river just at and below the mouth of chickamauga creek as soon as it arrives Thomas will attack on his left at the same time, and together it is expected to carry Missionary Ridge, 
and from there push a force on to the railroad between cleveland and dalton hooker will at the same time attack and if he can carry lookout mountain the enemy now seems to be looking for an attack on his left flank this favors us to further confirm this sherman's advanced division will march direct from whiteside to trenton the remainder of his force will pass over a new road just made from whiteside to kelly's ferry thus being concealed from the enemy and leave him to suppose the whole force is going up lookout valley sherman's advance has only just reached bridgeport the rear will only reach there on the sixteenth this will bring it to the nineteenth as the earliest day for making the combined movement as desired inform me if you think you can sustain yourself until this time i can hardly conceive of the enemy breaking through at kingston and pushing for kentucky if they should however a new problem would be left for solution thomas has ordered a division of cavalry to the vicinity of sparta i will ascertain if they have started and inform you it will be entirely out of the question to send you ten thousand men not because they cannot be spared but how would they be fed after they got even one day east from here longstreet for some reason or other stopped at loudon until the thirteenth that being the terminus of his railroad communications it is probable he was directed to remain there awaiting orders he was in a position threatening knoxville and at the same time where he could be brought back speedily to chattanooga the day after Longstreet left Loudon, Sherman reached Bridgeport in person and proceeded on to see me that evening, the 14th, and reached Chattanooga the next day. My orders for battle were all prepared in advance of Sherman's arrival, except the dates, which could not be fixed while troops to be engaged were so far away. The possession of Lookout Mountain was of no special advantage to us now. Hooker was instructed to send Howard's Corps to the north side of the Tennessee, thence up behind the hills on the north side, and to go into camp opposite Chattanooga. With the remainder of the command, Hooker was, at a time to be afterwards appointed, to ascend the western slope between the upper and lower palisades and so get into chattanooga valley the plan of battle was for sherman to attack the enemy's right flank form a line across it extend our left over south chickamauga river so as to threaten or hold the railroad in bragg's rear and thus force him either to weaken his lines elsewhere or lose his connection with his base at chickamauga station hooker was to perform like service on our right his problem was to get from lookout valley to chattanooga valley in the most expeditious way possible cross the latter valley rapidly to rossville south of bragg's line on missionary ridge form line there across the ridge facing north with his right flank extended to Chickamauga Valley east of the ridge, thus threatening the enemy's rear on that flank and compelling him to reinforce this also. Thomas, with the Army of the Cumberland, occupied the center and was to assault while the enemy was engaged with most of his forces on his two flanks. To carry out this plan, sherman was to cross the tennessee at brown's ferry and move east of chattanooga to a point opposite the north end of mission ridge and to place his command back of the foothills out of sight of the enemy on the ridge there are two streams called chickamauga emptying into the tennessee river east of chattanooga north chickamauga taking its rise in tennessee flowing south and emptying into the river some seven or eight miles east while the south chickamauga 
which takes its rise in Georgia, flows northward and empties into the Tennessee some three or four miles above the town. There were now 116 pontoons in the North Chickamauga River, their presence there being unknown to the enemy. At night, a division was to be marched up to that point, and at two o'clock in the morning moved down with the current, thirty men in each boat. A few were to land east of the mouth of the South Chickamauga, capture the pickets there, and then lay a bridge connecting the two banks of the river. The rest were to land on the south side of the Tennessee, where Missionary Ridge would strike it, if prolonged, and a sufficient number of men to man the boats were to push to the north side to ferry over the main body of Sherman's command while those left on the south side entrenched themselves. Thomas was to move out from his lines facing the ridge, leaving enough of Palmer's corps to guard against an attack down the valley. Lookout Valley being of no present value to us, and being untenable by the enemy if we should secure Missionary Ridge, Hooker's orders were changed. His revised orders brought him to Chattanooga by the established route north of the Tennessee. He was then to move out to the right to Rossville. Hooker's position in Lookout Valley was absolutely essential to us so long as Chattanooga was besieged. It was the key to our line for supplying the army. But it was not essential after the enemy was dispersed from our front, or even after the battle for this purpose was begun. Hooker's orders, therefore, were designed to get his force past Lookout Mountain and Chattanooga Valley, and up to Missionary Ridge. By crossing the north face of Lookout, the troops would come into Chattanooga Valley in rear of the line held by the enemy across the valley, and would necessarily force its evacuation. Orders were accordingly given to march by this route. But days before the battle began, the advantages as well as the disadvantages of this plan of action were all considered. The passage over the mountain was a difficult one to make in the face of an enemy. It might consume so much time as to lose us the use of the troops engaged in it at other points where they were more wanted. After reaching Chattanooga Valley, the creek of the same name, quite a formidable stream to get an army over, had to be crossed. I was perfectly willing that the enemy should keep Lookout Mountain until we got through with the troops on Missionary Ridge. By marching Hooker to the north side of the river, thence up the stream, and recrossing at the town, he could be got in position at any named time, when in this new position he would have Chattanooga Creek behind him, and the attack on Missionary Ridge would unquestionably cause the evacuation by the enemy of his line across the valley and on Lookout Mountain. Hooker's order was changed accordingly. As explained elsewhere, the original order had to be reverted to because of a flood in the river rendering the bridge at Brown's Ferry unsafe for the passage of troops at the exact juncture when it was wanted to bring all the troops together against Missionary Ridge. The next day, after Sherman's arrival, I took him, with General Thomas and Smith and other officers, to the north side of the river, and showed them the ground over which Sherman had to march, and pointed out generally what he was expected to do. I, as well as the authorities in Washington, was still in a great state of anxiety for Burnside's safety. Burnside himself, I believe, was the only one who did not share in this anxiety. Nothing could be done for him, however, until Sherman's troops were up. As soon, therefore, 
as the inspection was over sherman started for bridgeport to hasten matters rowing a boat himself i believe from kelly's ferry sherman had left bridgeport the night of the fourteenth reached chattanooga the evening of the fifteenth made the above described inspection on the morning of the sixteenth and started back the same evening to hurry up his command fully appreciating the importance of time his march was conducted with as much expedition as the roads and season would admit of by the twentieth he was himself at brown's ferry with the head of column but many of his troops were far behind and one division ewing's was at trenton sent that way to create the impression that lookout was to be taken from the south sherman received his orders at the ferry and was asked if he could not be ready for the assault the following morning news had been received that the battle had been commenced at knoxville burnside had been cut off from telegraphic communications the president the secretary of war and general halleck were in an agony of suspense my suspense was also great but more endurable because i was where i could soon do something to relieve the situation it was impossible to get sherman's troops up for the next day i then asked him if they could not be got up to make the assault on the morning of the twenty-second and ordered thomas to move on that date but the elements were against us it rained all the twentieth and twenty-first the river rose so rapidly that it was difficult to keep the pontoons in place general orlando b wilcox a division commander under burnside was at this time occupying a position farther up the valley than knoxville about maynardville and was still in telegraphic communication with the north a dispatch was received from him saying that he was threatened from the east the following was sent in reply if you can communicate with general burnside say to him that our attack on bragg will commence in the morning if successful such a move will be made as i think will relieve east tennessee if he can hold out longstreet passing through our lines to kentucky need not cause alarm he would find the country so bare that he would lose his transportation and artillery before reaching kentucky and would meet such a force before he got through that he could not return meantime sherman continued his crossing without intermission as fast as his troops could be got up the crossing had to be effected in full view of the enemy on the top of lookout mountain once over however the troops soon disappeared behind the detached hill on the north side and would not come to view again either to watchmen on lookout mountain or missionary ridge until they emerged between the hills to strike the bank of the river but when sherman's advance reached a point opposite the town of chattanooga howard who it will be remembered had been concealed behind the hills on the north side took up his line of march to join the troops on the south side his crossing was in full view both from missionary ridge and the top of lookout and the enemy of course supposed these troops to be sherman's this enabled sherman to get to his assigned position without discovery end of section forty two recording by jim clevenger little rock arkansas jim at j o c c l e v dot com forty three of personal memoirs of u s grant this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim clevenger personal memoirs of u s grant by ulysses s grant chapter forty three 
Preparations for battle. Thomas carries the first line of the enemy. Sherman carries Missionary Ridge. Battle of Lookout Mountain. General Hooker's fight. On the 20th, when so much was occurring to discourage, rains falling so heavily as to delay the passage of troops over the river at Brown's Ferry and threatening the entire breaking of the bridge, news coming of a battle raging at Knoxville, of Wilcox being threatened by a force from the east, a letter was received from Bragg which contained these words, As there may still be some non-combatants in Chattanooga, I deem it proper to notify you that prudence would dictate their early withdrawal. Of course, I understood that this was a device intended to deceive, but I did not know what the intended deception was. On the 22nd, however, a deserter came in who informed me that Bragg was leaving our front, and on that day Buckner's division was sent to reinforce Longstreet at Knoxville, and another division started to follow but was recalled. The object of Bragg's letter, no doubt, was in some way to detain me until Knoxville could be captured, and his troops there be returned to Chattanooga. During the night of the 21st, the rest of the pontoon boats, completed, 116 in all, were carried up to and placed in North Chickamauga. The material for the roadway over these was deposited out of view of the enemy within a few hundred yards of the bank of the Tennessee, where the north end of the bridge was to rest. Hearing nothing from Burnside, and hearing much of the distress in Washington on his account, I could no longer defer operations for his relief. I determined, therefore, to do on the 23rd with the Army of the Cumberland what had been intended to be done on the 24th. The position occupied by the Army of the Cumberland had been made very strong for defense during the months it had been besieged. The line was about a mile from the town, and extended from Sitico Creek, a small stream running near the base of Missionary Ridge, and emptying into the Tennessee, about two miles below the mouth of the South Chickamauga, on the left, to Chattanooga Creek, on the right. All commanding points on the line were well fortified and well equipped with artillery. The important elevations within the line had all been carefully fortified and supplied with a proper armament. Among the elevations so fortified was one to the east of the town, named Fort Wood. It owed its importance chiefly to the fact that it lay between the town and Missionary Ridge, where most of the strength of the enemy was. Fort Wood had in it twenty-two pieces of artillery, most of which would reach the nearer points of the enemy's line. On the morning of the 23rd, Thomas, according to instructions, moved Granger's Corps of two divisions, Sheridan and T.J. Wood commanding, to the foot of Fort Wood, and formed them into line as if going on parade. Sheridan, on the right, Wood to the left, extending to or near Sitico Creek. Palmer, commanding the 14th Corps, held that part of our line facing south and southwest. He supported Sheridan with one division, Baird's, while his other division, under Johnson, remained in the trenches under arms, ready to be moved to any point. Howard's corps was moved in rear of the center. The picket lines were within a few hundred yards of each other. At two o'clock in the afternoon, all were ready to advance. By this time, the clouds had lifted so 
that the enemy could see from his elevated position all that was going on the signal for advance was given by a booming of cannon from fort wood and other points on the line the rebel pickets were soon driven back upon the main guards which occupied minor and detached heights between the main ridge and our lines these two were carried before halting and before the enemy had time to reinforce their advance guards but it was not without loss on both sides this movement secured to us a line fully a mile in advance of the one we occupied in the morning and the one which the enemy had occupied up to this time the fortifications were rapidly turned to face the other way during the following night they were made strong we lost in this preliminary action about eleven hundred killed and wounded while the enemy probably lost quite as heavily including the prisoners that were captured with the exception of the firing of artillery kept up from missionary ridge and fort wood until night closed in this ended the fighting for the first day the advantage was greatly on our side now and if i could only have been assured that burnside could hold out ten days longer i should have rested more easily but we were doing the best we could for him and the cause by the night of the twenty-third sherman's command was in a position to move though one division osterhouse's had not yet crossed the river at brown's ferry the continuous rise in the tennessee had rendered it impossible to keep the bridge at that point in condition for troops to cross but i was determined to move that night even without this division orders were sent to osterhaus accordingly to report to hooker if he could not cross by eight o'clock on the morning of the twenty fourth because of the break in the bridge hooker's orders were again changed but this time only back to those first given to him general w f smith had been assigned to duty as chief engineer of the military division to him were given the general direction of moving troops by the boats from north chickamauga laying the bridge after they reached their position and generally all the duties pertaining to his office of chief engineer during the night general morgan l smith's division was marched to the point where the pontoons were and the brigade of giles a smith was selected for the delicate duty of manning the boats and surprising the enemy's pickets on the south bank of the river during this night also general j m brannan chief of artillery moved forty pieces of artillery belonging to the army of the cumberland and placed them on the north side of the river so as to command the ground opposite to aid in protecting the approach to the point where the south end of the bridge was to rest he had to use sherman's artillery horses for this purpose thomas having none at two o'clock in the morning november twenty fourth giles a smith pushed out from the north chickamauga with his one hundred and sixteen boats each loaded with thirty brave and well-armed men the boats with their precious freight dropped down quietly with the current to avoid attracting the attention of any one who could convey information to the enemy until arriving near the mouth of south chickamauga here a few boats were landed the troops debarked and a rush was made upon the picket guard known to be at that point the guard were surprised and twenty of their number captured the remainder of the troops effected a landing at the point where the bridge was to start with equally good results the work of ferrying over sherman's command from the north side of the tennessee was at once commenced using the pontoons for the purpose a steamer was also brought up from the town to assist the rest of m l smith's division came first 
then the division of john e smith the troops as they landed were put to work entrenching their position by daylight the two entire divisions were over and well covered by the works they had built the work of laying the bridge on which to cross the artillery and cavalry was now begun the ferrying over the infantry was continued with the steamer and the pontoons taking the pontoons however as fast as they were wanted to put in their place in the bridge by a little past noon the bridge was completed as well as one over the south chickamauga connecting the troops left on that side with their comrades below and all the infantry and artillery were on the south bank of the tennessee sherman at once formed his troops for assault on missionary ridge by one o'clock he started with m l smith on his left keeping nearly the course of chickamauga river j e smith next to the right and a little to the rear and ewing still farther to the right and also a little to the rear of j e smith's command in column ready to deploy to the right if an enemy should come from that direction a good skirmish line preceded each of these columns soon the foot of the hill was reached the skirmishers pushed directly up followed closely by their supports by half past three sherman was in possession of the height without having sustained much loss a brigade from each division was now brought up and artillery was dragged to the top of the hill by hand the enemy did not seem to be aware of this movement until the top of the hill was gained there had been a drizzling rain during the day and the clouds were so low that lookout mountain and the top of missionary ridge were obscured from the view of persons in the valley but now the enemy opened fire upon their assailants and made several attempts with their skirmishers to drive them away but without avail later in the day a more determined attack was made but this too failed and sherman was left to fortify what he had gained sherman's cavalry took up its line of march soon after the bridge was completed and by half past three the whole of it was over both bridges and on its way to strike the enemy's communications at chickamauga station all of sherman's command was now south of the tennessee during the afternoon general giles a smith was severely wounded and carried from the field thomas having done on the twenty-third what was expected of him on the twenty-fourth there was nothing for him to do this day except to strengthen his position howard however effected a crossing of citico creek and a junction with sherman and was directed to report to him with two or three regiments of his command he moved in the morning along the banks of the tennessee and reached the point where the bridge was being laid he went out on the bridge as far as it was completed from the south end and saw sherman superintending the work from the north side and moving himself south as fast as an additional boat was put in and the roadway put upon it howard reported to his new chief across the chasm between them which was now narrow and in a few minutes closed while these operations were going on to the east of chattanooga hooker was engaged on the west he had three divisions osterhouses of the fifteenth corps army of the tennessee geary's twelfth corps army of the potomac and cruff's fourteenth corps army of the cumberland geary was on the right at wahatchee cruft at the center and osterhaus near brown's ferry these troops were all west of lookout creek the enemy had the east bank of the creek strongly picketed and entrenched and three brigades of troops in the rear to reinforce them if attacked these brigades occupied the summit of the mountain 
General Carter L. Stevenson was in command of the whole, why any troops, except artillery with a small infantry guard, were kept on the mountain top, I do not see. A hundred men could have held the summit, which is a palisade for more than thirty feet down, against the assault of any number of men from the position Hooker occupied. The side of Lookout Mountain confronting Hooker's command was rugged, heavily timbered, and full of chasms, making it difficult to advance with troops, even in the absence of an opposing force. Farther up, the ground becomes more even and level, and was in cultivation. On the east side, the slope is much more gradual, and a good wagon road zigzagging up it connects the town of Chattanooga with the summit. Early on the morning of the 24th, Hooker moved Geary's division, supported by a brigade of Crufts, up Lookout Creek to effect a crossing. The remainder of Crufts' division was to seize the bridge over the creek, near the crossing of the railroad. Osterhaus was to move up to the bridge and cross it. The bridge was seized by Gross's brigade after a slight skirmish with the pickets guarding it. This attracted the enemy so that Geary's movement farther up was not observed. A heavy mist obscured him from the view of the troops on the top of the mountain. He crossed the creek, almost unobserved, and captured the picket of over forty men on guard nearby. He then commenced ascending the mountain directly in his front. By this time, the enemy was seen coming down from their camps on the mountain slope and filing into their rifle pits to contest the crossing of the bridge. By eleven o'clock the bridge was complete. Osterhaus was up, and, after some sharp skirmishing, the enemy was driven away with considerable loss in killed and captured. While the operations at the bridge were progressing, Geary was pushing up the hill over great obstacles, resisted by the enemy directly in his front, and in face of the guns on top of the mountain. The enemy, seeing their left flank and rear menaced, gave way, and were followed by Cruft and Osterhaus. Soon these were up abreast of Geary, and the whole command pushed up the hill, driving the enemy in advance. By noon, Geary had gained the open ground on the north slope of the mountain, with his right closed up to the base of the upper palisade, but there were strong fortifications in his front. The rest of the command coming up, a line was formed from the base of the upper palisade to the mouth of Chattanooga Creek. Thomas and I were on the top of Orchard Knob. Hooker's advance now made our line a continuous one. It was in full view, extending from the Tennessee River, where Sherman had crossed, up Chickamauga River to the base of Mission Ridge, over the top of the north end of the ridge to Chattanooga Valley, then along parallel to the ridge a mile or more, across the valley to the mouth of Chattanooga Creek, thence up the slope of Lookout Mountain to the foot of the upper palisade. The day was hazy, so that Hooker's operations were not visible to us, except at moments when the clouds would rise. But the sound of his artillery and musketry was heard incessantly. The enemy on his front was partially fortified, but was soon driven out of his works. During the afternoon, the clouds, which had so obscured the top of Lookout all day as to hide whatever was going on from the view of those below, settled down and made it so dark where Hooker was as to stop operations for the time. At four o'clock, Hooker reported his position as impregnable. By a little after five, direct communication was established, and a brigade of troops was sent from Chattanooga, to reinforce him. These troops had to cross Chattanooga Creek and met with some opposition, but soon overcame it, and by night the commander, General Carlin, reported to Hooker and was assigned to his left. I now telegraphed to Washington. The fight today progressed favorably. 
Sherman carried the end of Missionary Ridge, and his right is now at the tunnel, and his left at Chickamauga Creek. Troops from Lookout Valley carried the point of the mountain, and now hold the eastern slope and a point high up. Hooker reports 2,000 prisoners taken, besides which a small number have fallen into our hands from Missionary Ridge. The next day the President replied, Your dispatches as to fighting on Monday and Tuesday are here. Well done. Many thanks to all. Remember Burnside. And Halleck also telegraphed, I congratulate you on the success thus far of your plans. I fear that Burnside is hard pushed and that any further delay may prove fatal. I know you will do all in your power to relieve him. The division of Jefferson C. Davis, Army of the Cumberland, had been sent to the North Chickamauga to guard the pontoons as they were deposited in the river, and to prevent all ingress or egress of citizens. On the night of the 24th, his division, having crossed with Sherman, occupied our extreme left, from the upper bridge over the plain to the north base of Missionary Ridge. Firing continued to a late hour in the night, but it was not connected with an assault at any point. End of section 43. Recording by Jim Clevenger, Little Rock, Arkansas. Jim at J-O-C-C-L-E-V dot com. four of personal memoirs of u s grant this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jim clevenger personal memoirs of u s grant by ulysses s grant chapter forty four battle of chattanooga a gallant charge complete rout of the enemy pursuit of the confederates general bragg remarks on chattanooga at twelve o'clock at night when all was quiet i began to give orders for the next day and sent a dispatch to wilcox to encourage burnside sherman was directed to attack at daylight hooker was ordered to move at the same hour and endeavor to intercept the enemy's retreat if he still remained if he had gone then to move directly to rossville and operate against the left and rear of the force on missionary ridge thomas was not to move until hooker had reached missionary ridge as i was with him on orchard knob he would not move without further orders from me the morning of the twenty fifth opened clear and bright and the whole field was in full view from the top of Orchard Knob. It remained so all day. Bragg's headquarters were in full view, and officers, presumably staff officers, could be seen coming and going constantly. The point of ground which Sherman had carried on the 24th was almost disconnected from the main ridge occupied by the enemy. A low pass, over which there is a wagon road crossing the hill, and near which there is a railroad tunnel, intervenes between the two hills. The problem now was to get to the main ridge. The enemy was fortified on the point, and back farther. Where the ground was still higher was a second fortification commanding the first. Sherman was out as soon as it was light enough to see and by sunrise his command was in motion three brigades held a hill already gained morgan l smith moved along the east base of missionary ridge loomis along the west base supported by two brigades of john e smith's division and corps with his brigade was between the two moving directly towards the hill to be captured the ridge is steep and heavily wooded on the east side where m l smith's troops were advancing but cleared and with a more gentle slope on the west side the troops advanced rapidly and carried the extreme end of the rebel works 
Morgan L. Smith advanced to a point which cut the enemy off from the railroad bridge and the means of bringing up supplies by rail from Chickamauga Station, where the main depot was located. The enemy made brave and strenuous efforts to drive our troops from the position we had gained, but without success. The contest lasted for two hours. Of course, a brave and efficient commander was badly wounded in this assault. Sherman now threatened both Bragg's flank and his stores, and made it necessary for him to weaken other points of his line to strengthen his right. From the position I occupied, I could see column after column of Bragg's forces moving against Sherman. Every Confederate gun that could be brought to bear upon the Union forces was concentrated upon him. J. E. Smith, with two brigades, charged up the west side of the ridge to the support of Corse's command, over open ground and in the face of a heavy fire of both artillery and musketry, and reached the very parapet of the enemy. He lay there for a time, but the enemy coming with a heavy force upon his right flank, he was compelled to fall back, followed by the foe. A few hundred yards brought Smith's troops into a wood, where they were speedily reformed when they charged and drove the attacking party back to its entrenchments. Seeing the advance, repulse, and second advance of J. E. Smith from the position I occupied, I directed Thomas to send a division to reinforce him. Baird's division was accordingly sent from the right of Orchard Knob. It had to march a considerable distance directly under the eye of the enemy to reach its position. Bragg at once commenced massing in the same direction. This was what I wanted. But it had now got to be late in the afternoon, and I had expected before this to see Hooker crossing the ridge in the neighborhood of Rossville and compelling Bragg to mass in that direction also. The enemy had evacuated Lookout Mountain during the night, as I expected he would. In crossing the valley, he burned the bridge over Chattanooga Creek and did all he could to obstruct the roads behind him. Hooker was off bright and early with no obstructions in his front but distance and the destruction above named. He was detained four hours crossing Chattanooga Creek and thus was lost the immediate advantage I expected from his forces. His reaching Bragg's flank and extending across it was to be the signal for Thomas's assault of the ridge. But Sherman's condition was getting so critical that the assault for his relief could not be delayed any longer. Sheridan's and Wood's divisions had been lying under arms from early morning, ready to move the instant the signal was given. I now directed Thomas to order the charge at once. I watched eagerly to see the effect, and became impatient at last that there was no indication of any charge being made. The center of the line which was to make the charge was near where Thomas and I stood, but concealed from view by an intervening forest. Turning to Thomas to inquire what caused the delay, I was surprised to see Thomas J. Wood, one of the division commanders who was to make the charge, standing talking to him. I spoke to General Wood, asking him why he did not charge as ordered an hour before. He replied very promptly that this was the first he had heard of it, but that he had been ready all day to move at a moment's notice. I told him to make the charge at once. He was off in a moment, and in an incredibly short time loud cheering was heard, and he and Sheridan were driving the enemy's advance before them towards Missionary Ridge. The Confederates were strongly entrenched on the crest of the ridge in front of us, 
and had a second line halfway down and another at the base our men drove the troops in front of the lower line of rifle pits so rapidly and followed them so closely that rebel and union troops went over the first line of works almost at the same time many rebels were captured and sent to the rear under the fire of their own friends higher up the hill those that were not captured retreated and were pursued the retreating hordes being between friends and pursuers caused the enemy to fire high to avoid killing their own men in fact on that occasion the union soldier nearest the enemy was in the safest position without awaiting further orders or stopping to reform on our troops went to the second line of works over that and on for the crest thus effectually carrying out my orders of the eighteenth for the battle and of the twenty-fourth for this charge i watched their progress with intense interest the fire along the rebel line was terrific cannon and musket balls filled the air but the damage done was in small proportion to the ammunition expended the pursuit continued until the crest was reached and soon our men were seen climbing over the confederate barriers at different points in front of both sheridan's and wood's divisions the retreat of the enemy along most of his line was precipitate and the panic so great that bragg and his officers lost all control over their men many were captured and thousands threw away their arms in their flight sheridan pushed forward until he reached the chickamauga river at a point above where the enemy crossed he met some resistance from troops occupying a second hill in rear of missionary ridge probably to cover the retreat of the main body and of the artillery and trains it was now getting dark but sheridan without halting on that account pushed his men forward up this second hill slowly and without attracting the attention of the men placed to defend it while he detached to the right and left to surround the position the enemy discovered the movement before this disposition was complete and beat a hasty retreat leaving artillery wagon trains and many prisoners in our hands to sheridan's prompt movement the army of the cumberland and the nation are indebted for the bulk of the capture of prisoners artillery and small arms that day except for his prompt pursuit so much in this way would not have been accomplished while the advance up missionary ridge was going forward general thomas with staff general gordon granger commander of the corps making the assault and myself and staff occupied orchard knob from which the entire field could be observed the moment the troops were seen going over the last line of rebel defenses i ordered granger to join his command and mounting my horse i rode to the front general thomas left about the same time sheridan on the extreme right was already in pursuit of the enemy east of the ridge wood who commanded the division to the left of sheridan accompanied his men on horseback in the charge but did not join sheridan in the pursuit to the left in baird's front where bragg's troops had massed against sherman the resistance was more stubborn and the contest lasted longer i ordered granger to follow the enemy with wood's division but he was so much excited and kept up such a roar of musketry in the direction the enemy had taken that by the time i could stop the firing the enemy had got well out of the way the enemy confronting sherman now seeing everything to their left giving way fled also sherman however was not aware of the extent of our success until after nightfall when he received orders to pursue at daylight in the morning as soon as sherman discovered that the enemy had left his front he directed his reserves 
Davis's division of the Army of the Cumberland, to push over the pontoon bridge at the mouth of the Chickamauga and to move forward to Chickamauga Station. He ordered Howard to move up the stream some two miles to where there was an old bridge, repair it during the night, and follow Davis at four o'clock in the morning. Morgan L. Smith was ordered to reconnoiter the tunnel to see if that was still held. Nothing was found there but dead bodies of men of both armies. The rest of Sherman's command was directed to follow Howard at daylight in the morning to get on to the railroad towards Graysville. Hooker, as stated, was detained at Chattanooga Creek by the destruction of the bridge at that point. He got his troops over, with the exception of the artillery, by fording the stream at a little after three o'clock leaving his artillery to follow when the bridge should be reconstructed he pushed on with the remainder of his command at rossville he came upon the flank of a division of the enemy which soon commenced a retreat along the ridge this threw them on palmer they could make but little resistance in the position they were caught in and as many of them as could do so escaped many however were captured Hooker's position during the night of the 25th was near Rossville, extending east of the ridge. Palmer was on his left, on the road to Graysville. During the night I telegraphed to Wilcox that Bragg had been defeated, and that immediate relief would be sent to Burnside if he could hold out. To Halleck I sent an announcement of our victory and informed him, that forces would be sent up the valley to relieve Burnside. Before the Battle of Chattanooga opened, I had taken measures for the relief of Burnside the moment the way should be clear. Thomas was directed to have the little steamer that had been built at Chattanooga loaded to its capacity with rations and ammunition. Granger's Corps was to move by the south bank of the Tennessee River to the mouth of the Holston, and up that to Knoxville accompanied by the boat. In addition to the supplies transported by boat, the men were to carry forty rounds of ammunition in their cartridge boxes and four days' rations in haversacks. In the Battle of Chattanooga, troops from the Army of the Potomac from the Army of the Tennessee and from the Army of the Cumberland participated. In fact, the accidents growing out of the heavy rains and the sudden rise in the Tennessee River so mingled the troops that the organizations were not kept together under their respective commanders during the battle. Hooker, on the right, had Geary's division of the 12th Corps, Army of the Potomac, Osterhaus's division of the 15th Corps, Army of the Tennessee, and Cruft's division of the Army of the Cumberland. Sherman had three divisions of his own army, Howard's Corps from the Army of the Potomac, and Jefferson C. Davis's division of the Army of the Cumberland. There was no jealousy, hardly rivalry. Indeed, I doubt whether officers or men took any note at the time of the fact of this intermingling of commands. All saw a defiant foe surrounding them, and took it for granted that every move was intended to dislodge him, and it made no difference where the troops came from, so that the end was accomplished. The victory at Chattanooga was won against great odds, considering the advantage the enemy had of position and was accomplished more easily than was expected by reason of Bragg's making several grave mistakes. First, in sending away his ablest corps commander with over 20,000 troops. Second, in sending away a division of troops on the eve of battle. Third, in placing so much of a force on the plain in front of his impregnable position. It was known that Mr. Jefferson Davis had visited Bragg on Missionary Ridge a short time before my reaching Chattanooga. 
It was reported and believed that he had come out to reconcile a serious difference between Bragg and Longstreet, and, finding this difficult to do, planned the campaign against Knoxville to be conducted by the latter general. I had known both Bragg and Longstreet before the war, the latter very well. We had been three years at West Point together, and after my graduation for a time in the same regiment. Then we served together in the Mexican War. I had known Bragg in Mexico, and met him occasionally subsequently. I could well understand how there might be an irreconcilable difference between them. Bragg was a remarkably intelligent and well-informed man, professionally and otherwise. He was also thoroughly upright, but he was possessed of an irascible temper, and was naturally disputatious, a man of the highest moral character and the most correct habits, yet in the old army he was in frequent trouble. As a subordinate, he was always on the lookout to catch his commanding officer infringing his prerogatives. As a post commander, he was equally vigilant to detect the slightest neglect, even of the most trivial order. I have heard in the old army an anecdote very characteristic of Bragg. On one occasion, when stationed at a post of several companies, Commanded by a field officer, he was himself commanding one of the companies and at the same time acting as post quartermaster and commissary. He was first lieutenant at the time, but his captain was detached on other duty. As commander of the company, he made a requisition upon the quartermaster, himself, for something he wanted. As quartermaster, he declined to fill the requisition and endorsed on the back of it his reason for so doing. As company commander, he responded to this, urging that his requisition called for nothing but what he was entitled to, and that it was the duty of the quartermaster to fill it. As quartermaster, he still persisted that he was right. In this condition of affairs, Bragg referred the whole matter to the commanding officer of the post. The latter, when he saw the nature of the matter referred, exclaimed, My God, Mr. Bragg, you have quarreled with every officer in the army, and now you are quarreling with yourself. Longstreet was an entirely different man. He was brave, honest, intelligent, a very capable soldier, subordinate to his superiors, just and kind to his subordinates, but jealous of his own rights, which he had the courage to maintain. He was never on the lookout to detect a slight, but saw one as soon as anybody when intentionally given. It may be that Longstreet was not sent to Knoxville for the reason stated but because Mr. Davis had an exalted opinion of his own military genius, and thought he saw a chance of killing two birds with one stone, on several occasions during the war he came to the relief of the Union Army by means of his superior military genius. I speak advisedly when I saw Mr. Davis prided himself on his military capacity. He says so himself, virtually, in his answer to the notice of his nomination to the Confederate presidency. Some of his generals have said so in their writings since the downfall of the Confederacy. My recollection is that my first orders for the Battle of Chattanooga were as fought. Sherman was to get on Missionary Ridge, as he did, Hooker to cross the north end of Lookout Mountain, as he did, sweep across Chattanooga Valley and get across the south end of the ridge near Rossville. When Hooker had secured that position, the Army of the Cumberland was to assault in the center. Before Sherman arrived, however, 
the order was so changed as that hooker was directed to come to chattanooga by the north bank of the tennessee river the waters in the river owing to heavy rains rose so fast that the bridge at brown's ferry could not be maintained in a condition to be used in crossing troops upon it for this reason hooker's orders were changed by telegraph back to what they were originally note from this point on this volume was written with the exception of the campaign in the wilderness which had been previously written by general grant after his great illness in april and the present arrangement of the subject matter was made by him between the tenth and eighteenth of july eighteen eighty five end of section forty four recording by jim clevenger little rock arkansas jim at j o c c l e v dot com